in the house of the Lord today. Now while you're standing, how about flipping to Hebrews 4 also? Hebrews 4 also. Hebrews 4 and the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. There are several things that I want to look at today, and I hope that it will be a real blessing to your heart. I'm going to begin reading in verse, uh, let's go to verse number 12, Revelation chapter number 2, verse 12. I love you today, always have, not ashamed of that love I have for you, not ashamed of using the Word of God to reprove, rebuke, instruct, correct the congregation. That is my duty, my obligation, and, and so I appreciate you allowing me to pastor. I'm not, I don't want to be your preacher. I want to be your pastor, and I don't take that lightly. Verse 12, glad Daryl and Tina's back. Amen. What a blessing that is. You, you go off on a cruise, a worldly cruise like that, and they just don't come to Sunday school no more. Ain't that something? No, I, I know what I know what's going on. I knew, but I was going to give him. I told him, I said, Brother Darrell, you didn't bring you didn't bring none of them little umbrellas back, did you? He said, No, sir. I said, Okay, good. But I'm we missed them, and I'm glad that they're back. Christy is at at uh, another church today. Gary said uh, with some family, so you do, we miss her today also. But I'm glad you're all here. Verse twelve of Revelation chapter number 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Amen. This is actually the sixth lesson of our study of the book of Revelation, and I felt impressed of the Lord to be here today. And There's a lot of things that we could say about this letter that... God impressed upon the Apostle John to write to uh, the congregation of the Christians or the churches of Pergamos, but uh, there's just a few things that I really want to uh, really dig deep in and look at today and ask the Holy Spirit to be so kind to deal with our hearts. Today, Pergamos, of course this is our third letter, Pergamos is called Pergamum. P-E-R-G-A-M-U-N. The name has changed. Back in the days of John, it was a royal city. Of course, it was there, of course, if you remember, in Asia Minor, the province of Asia, and it was ruled by the Roman Empire. And this city was the chief city, or what we would call the capital city of the province of Asia. A magnificent city. Uh, here shortly we'll share with you some of the temples and some of the false gods, the elaborate temples and sanctuaries they had set up 
for these false gods. There was there in this city a lot of commerce. This city was located on the Great Road, it was called. We mentioned how that these seven churches that God has addressed to through John's uh, letter, that all seven of these were close to this great road. And of course, these were not the only Christians in Asia Minor and the province of Asia at this time, but these were the churches that the letter would be passed to, and, and it is believed that these letters was passed from church to church because of this great road, and, and it was passed on to us today. God had everything under control, and He has preserved His Word. I heard a Catholic priest say yesterday on a radio broadcast that, that the first 11, I believe, chapters of Genesis was a moral myth and that the Roman Catholic Church believed that Jonah and the whale was a moral myth, that the story was ordained, inspired to be wrote, but it was not a true story. And I told my wife, I said, if that be so, the only sign that Jesus said concerning his resurrection was this, as Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. And so if Jonah in the belly of the whale was a myth, then Jesus' resurrection is a myth. And we're lost and on our way to damnation. But thank God it's true. And God has preserved his word and he has preserved this third letter that we have in Revelation so you and I can spiritually apply it to our lives, to our hearts today. Now, as I said earlier about these large temples, magnificent, elaborate temples that they had for these false gods, one of these false gods was the God of healing. It is reported, recorded, that Caesar Augustus would travel to this city so that he could enter into this temple, so that he could receive the blessing of healing. Basically, he was a drunk, and he needed to be dried out. And so when you study these, this time and these temples, you would see that people would come to these temples to be healed. I read a story from a preacher friend of mine who did an in-depth study about this temple of healing, the God of healing. And he said that you would enter into the temple of healing and you would walk down a narrow tunnel and there would be holes cut out in the roof of the tunnel where a cool breeze could enter the tunnel. It was uh, not a lot of light in the tunnel, kind of a not dark, depressing, but just kind of a... a, a, a enough, uh, just, you know, dimmed enough where people could relax, have a good spirit. And there would be ladies that would be on top of the roof whispering through the holes of that tunnel, you're going to be all right. You're going to get better. And they would hear that as they walked through that tunnel. He said that when you went through those that tunnel and hear those calm, pleasant voices of these ladies that you're going to be well, that they would be led to some hot pools. And they would spend so much time in these hot pools. And if by then you were not better, then you had to stay overnight. And how you stayed overnight and what you did was that they would turn out all the lamps and the lanterns and you would lay on the floor and they would let loose non-poisonous snakes and they would crawl on you all night long. I don't know if that would heal you or give you a heart attack. I believe if I knew that process, by the time I got out of the hot pool, I said, I've never felt better in my life. I'm just fine. Amen. Or I need another doctor's opinion. Silliness. Amen. That's what pagan religion is. Silliness. And... This city of Pergamos was the seat of Satan. That's what it means. It was the seat of many different cults and false religions. And that's why we have that phrase in verse 13, the Satan's seat. But I, I want you to, first of all, notice verse 12, and, I, and I'll share my thoughts and allow the Lord to speak, uh, hopefully, to your heart, and you can respond to the Lord today. 
And, the, and to the angel of the church, we understood the angel is referring to the pastor. You may think I'm demonic, but I'm not. According to God, I'm the angel. Amen. To the pastor of the church, usually when Daddy corrected me or Daddy didn't told me I couldn't do that, I thought he was mean too, right? But I knew he loved me. Amen. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things said he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I have in my study two different swords. This is Solomon's sword, or what it's called. This sword stays in my office or on the wall there because it reminds me of the time that Solomon prayed for wisdom. He said, God, I need wisdom. You'll see the star of David here. He said, I need wisdom to judge these great people. I need spiritual discernment, Lord, to judge these people. And so the Bible says that God granted his request and also gave him riches because he prayed according to God's will, not according to his will. And the Bible says that the first instance where his wisdom was seen was when these two ladies were in the same bed and they both had infant children. And while one was sleeping, she rolled over on that infant baby and smothered that baby to death. She woke up early in the morning. She realized that she had smothered her own baby. So she took the dead baby and swapped it with the living baby. In other words, she not only, and I know it wasn't in, in, intentionally, but not only did her child die, but she stole another woman's baby. So the mom woke up and she said, this baby has died. And she said, that's your baby. She said, that's not my baby. Now, can you, do you think you really can fool a mama? Even an infant baby, do you really think? And she was desperate. And so they decided to go to the king with the matter. And some of you know the story that they came and they were weeping and crying and they said, this woman smothered her own child and she took mine in the night and said, her child is living and mine is dead. And the other woman said, no, that's not how it happened. She smothered her own child and she stole mine. And so Solomon, with great wisdom that God had given him, he said, bring me a sword. And they brought him a sword and it wasn't a dagger, it was a long sword like this. And he said, put the baby in the middle. We're going to cut it in half, and we're going to give half to this mom, and we're going to give half to this mom. And immediately, the one that was the true mother said, Oh, O king, just go ahead and give her the child. He said, That's the mother right there. And so this sword reminds me of the spiritual discernment and the wisdom I need to judge such a great people as you, God's people. But the Bible says that it describes the Lord as the one that hath the sharp sword with the two edges. This has two edges. And I thought about Hebrews 4.12, and we're going to look at that a little bit today and get into this and we'll be dismissed. But the Lord talks a lot in the Word of God about a sword or His mouth being the sword, the Word of God being a sword with two edges. And in Hebrews 4.12, the Bible says that the Word of God is quick and is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. But notice that it says it's dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. Dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. Here in chapter 2 of verse 12, the Lord says that I'm he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, does he literally mean that he has a sword like this? No. He is speaking about his word. He said, my word is like no other word that's ever been spoken. My word is true. My word is without faults. It's without any uh, in, infallible uh, word or thought or deed or motive. He said, my word is true and is sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, in Hebrews 4.12, that phrase there that I want you to see is it says, dividing asunder. 
the soul and the spirit. Do you see that? Can I get some amens? We see that today. What does that mean, preacher? The Word of God, first of all, is two-edged. I believe that means several different things. I believe, number one, it means that it not only cuts sin, but it can cut the sinner. God hates sin, but listen to me, as a sinner, if you continue to go on without the Lord, you continue to reject His Word, reject His blood, that He will cut you with His sword, which is His Word, when He'll say one day, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. It also is two-edged. It gives us a picture that it not only can cut the heart of a sinner, aren't you glad there was a day in your life when you were away from God and the Word of God cut your heart, Amen. convicted you of your sin, and you fell before the Lord and said, Forgive me, a sinner, O God. Amen. But it not only cuts a sinner, but it cuts a saint. And how that cutting or the procedure that is found in Hebrews 4.12 is talking, I believe, about a saint being cut by the Word of God, the two-edged sword. And it says the procedure or the surgical procedure is like this. God will take His Word, which is a picture of a two-edged sword. He will take His Word, if you're a Christian today, with a spirit that is sour, with a testimony that is rotten, with a heart that is not right with God and hard against God, God said that He will, uh, not might, but He will take His Word. You say, well, now you won't do it when I ain't at church. Oh, even when you're not at church, His Word can find where you are. And He'll take His Word, and it's just like a two-edged sword, and He will pierce your heart so that He might what? Divide asunder. The Word is asunder, a very strong word. Divide asunder the soul and the spirit. Notice the word spirit is not capitalized. He's not saying I'll divide your soul from the Holy Spirit. Thank God that can't happen. We're sealed until the day of redemption. We always have. The question is not do you have the Holy Spirit if you're saved. The question is Brother, uh, brother, me, uh, brother Hardaway and myself were talking the other day is does the Holy Spirit have you? You know you have the Holy Spirit day you're saved but are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you controlled by the Holy Spirit? We've got a lot of Christians, yeah, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit, but they are not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so it's talking to you and I that are saved when we get away from the Lord, when we have things that God frowns upon, that it, He will use His Word, whether it be the man of God in the pulpit, whether it be the Sunday school teacher, whether it be you in your prayer closet, or you all along in your basement, or in your attic, or in the backyard, on the patio furniture, or in the front yard, on the front porch, God will use the Holy Spirit to take His Word, and He will pierce your hard heart. And he will divide asunder the soul from the spirit. What spirit? The spirit that is not godly. That spirit is a picture of sin. It is a picture of how when our spirit is not what it ought to be. It is a picture of when we're not right with God and we know it. We can blame other people. We can blame the preacher. We can blame our wives. We can try to blame our husbands. We can even blame our children, our government, our president. But we know within our heart the problem is... And let me say this in passing. I've got to go quickly here. You continue to blame everybody else. You'll never get right with God. You'll never know what real joy is because Satan has robbed it from you. He says, I will take this two-edged sword and I'll divide your soul from sin. Thank God for that. I have seen where, and you know about these things, where people have surgeries and they must divide maybe a cancer from a part of the body. And the doctor will take his little sword and he will make an incision and he will cut away or try to cut away that cancer or as in like Brother Wendell, that mass. Or some of you today, Miss Coker, I mentioned her last Sunday, what God has done for her. And he will try to cut that away. Bone spurs even. Cut it away. 
And God said, that's the picture I want you to see. I can put you on your back and I will take my word, and it's sharp enough, no matter how hard your heart may be, it's not too hard for the sword. And I will cut it asunder, and I'm trying to cut that sin from your soul. That's why some people are miserable. Number one, they don't get right with the Lord like they should. Number two, God is cut. It's, it's never a fun thing to get cut, is it? You don't say, whoopee, praise the Lord, I got cut up by God. God will cut us up, amen. And so the sword, the Bible says that he is the one with the sword of two edges. Now, what is he wanting to cut away from this church? What particular sin in closing is he wanting to cut away from this church? Notice in verse 13 and 14. I know thy works. He knows our works. And by the way, he knows why we do the work. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Now, wait a minute now. Why is that phrase there? He is saying there in Pergamos, he said that is where Satan's seat is. I thought it was Atlanta, Georgia, by the way. Some think San Francisco, some think Las Vegas. But uh, sometimes I think it's in Flyer Branch. But God says that there, this day and age, that the seat of Satan was located... There in Pergamos. What is he saying? He is saying all these false religions and all these false cults are everywhere and they're abounding and all this false doctrine is running rapid in this city. There's that temple of, to the false god of healing. The Bible says if you want to be healed, you pray the prayer of faith. You ask the elders of the church to anoint you with oil. And you trust the Lord and say, Lord, thy will be done. You don't run down to some temple of a false god. Amen. Some people spend more time watching Dr. Oz than they do on their knees praying to the real doctor. Amen. Some of the, I don't mind getting all the advice I can get, but when I rather get the advice of man and I be little or I use very little the advice of the great physician, I've got some problems. Amen. By the way, man cannot give you the answer to all your problems anyway. You've got to go to him. And so next they also had a temple, a great temple shaped like an altar. Now listen to this. It's... It's a little after 12, so we're going to get out here real soon. I'll, I'll put my watch here so you'll believe I'm paying attention. All right. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth has been here long enough. She knows that this does not work. <laughs> but there also was a temple shaped like a grand, magnificent altar. And guess who this was to? It was to the false god of Zeus. Zeus was considered the savior of not only the Greeks, but of the, many of the Romans. And there also was the temples that were dedicated to emperor worship. Did you know that these Christians were pressured to bow down to whoever the Caesar was at that time? Whoever the Roman emperor was that time, whether it be Caesar Augustus or Julius Caesar, they were to bow down and worship him, just like they had to do in the Old Testament to Nebuchadnezzar. They tried to set their self up as gods, and God said, that's full of wickedness. You don't worship man, you worship the Lord. So in verse 14 he says, now 13, there's one that's died because he stayed faithful. Thank God. How we, how do you think you're going to feel standing beside uh, Antipas who died for what he believed in? And we sometimes get mad because somebody laughs at us that we carry a Bible to our work. We get discouraged and don't come to church because the preaching got close to our corn. But here's a man that died for his faith. How are you going to feel standing beside that man? How are you going to feel standing beside Paul who got his head chopped off from his shoulders? Peter crucified upside down. James thrown from a third-story temple. 
How are you going to feel when you stand with Polycarp who was burned at the stake? All because they would not denounce their faith. They would not compromise. They would not turn their back on the Lord or the church or the people of God. They stood with the Lord and they had to die for it. Oh, God, forgive us of our weak spirits when we get persecuted. Verse 14, he says, I've got a few things against you. Oh, my. Now, watch this. We're closing. He says, because thou hast there them. Not the whole church was participating, but there were some in the church who claimed to be saved. Get ready. Fasten the seatbelt. They claimed to be saved. They claimed to know the Lord as others did. They sung the congregational songs that you sang. They say they love the preacher like you say you love the preacher, but their heart is wicked. Why? Because they hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, we don't have time to go to Numbers chapter 23, 24 and study that story. Hopefully, you know that story. If not, you ought to read that story. But Balak was the Moabite king. And Balak was afraid of how that Israel was growing and multiplying, just like God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he said, I've got to find a way. I can't defeat them in battle. They're too strong. They're too many. So how can we defeat these Israelites? And so he got this prophet by the name of Balaam. And Balaam comes down and he says, Hey, Balaam, I'll pay you much riches if you'll just share with me how I can defeat Israel. And, of course, Balaam, long story short, Balaam told me, he said, I know how they can be defeated. God has told them through the prophet Moses and Joshua that if they were to turn to false idols and false religions, and if they were to enter marriage with the heathen people, then God would allow their enemy to overtake them. So Balak said, thank you very much. That's what we'll do. So he sent down the prettiest women that he had available. And they got flirting around with those Israelite men and some of those foolish men fell. And guess what happened? When they fell in love, teenagers, you listen to this? When they fell in love with the heathen, when I use the word heathen, that means the lost. The Bible says you're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. I don't like that preaching. Go rip your Bible up. You're either saved or you're a heathen. And the Bible says that they allowed these heathen women to come down, and when they started dating them, they began to get married. Well, guess what comes along when you marry somebody that's not a Christian, that's not a saint, that doesn't believe like you believe? They bring in their beliefs. Amen. Thank you. And what happened all of a sudden, here come all them false gods of the Moabites. And you know, these husbands, they they got to please their wife. They're scared to death of their wife. Got to please them. And so they begin to worship their wives' gods. What did happen, preacher? You know what happened. The Moabites came in and put them in captivity. And he says that there's some in there that's got that spirit. There's some in the church that is acting the same way they did years ago when Balaam existed. He said they have the spirit or the doctrine of Balaam. Now, there's three things that I want to say in closing about Balaam. There is the era of Balaam. The Word of God speaks about the era of Balaam. And the era of Balaam was that God would curse Israel because they were sinners. God would curse. But when Balaam went to curse or put a curse on Israel, God wouldn't allow it, and he ended up blessing Israel. God will chastise you, but thank God we'll not have to live in the eternal curse of hell. That's the error of Balaam. Second of all is the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam, the reason that Balaam decided to go against Israel was what? Covetousness. He wanted money. He coveted money and riches and fortune and fame. That is the way of Balaam. If some preacher says, beware of the way of Balaam, they are speaking about being covenous about other things. But here is the doctrine of Balaam. What is that, preacher? He taught Balak, the king of the Moabites, the way to corrupt Israel was intermarriage, fornication. And when they committed physical adultery, then came spiritual adultery. 
They became untrue to their own wives. And then they became true to the holy wife of Israel and the church of Jesus Christ, God Himself. Physical adultery led to spiritual adultery. That is the doctrine of Balaam. And he says there's some in there that have that doctrine. Do you know what basically that means today? Basically, today that means this. If you want one word to describe the doctrine of Balaam, then the word I would give you would be compromise. Israel decided that the best thing maybe to do was to compromise their beliefs to compromise the doctrines of the Word of God. You said, preacher, they didn't have the Word of God. They did have the Word of God. Yeah. They didn't have it wrote down in a book like we do, but they had the Word of God. And they decided to compromise the doctrines, the beliefs, the fundamentals of the faith of God's Word. And because of that compromise... God allowed them to be chastised and to suffer great loss. And he says, there's some of you in there today in the church. You're compromising your beliefs. You're compromising the doctrines of the Word of God. Do you know we have several in our congregation today, some that are not even here, the reason that they're in this church is that they were in a church that compromised the truths of the Word of God. If you leave this church, I hope you don't. But by the help of God, you won't ever say honestly, I left because Pastor Benton compromised the truth and the doctrines of God's Word. And so they compromise. Compromise was running rapid in Pergamos. The pressure was on. The pressure was great. All these Christians had to compromise their beliefs and the doctrines of their faith or else they were going to be persecuted or else they were going to lose their homes and their friends and their jobs. So the pressure was heavy upon them to compromise. You can worship God, but you need to also bow down to Caesar. You can worship God, but you also better bow down to Zeus. You can worship God and trust Him and pray for His healing, but you also must attend the festivals of healing so some of them said, well, I'm already saved. I'm going to heaven. I've been taught by the Apostle Paul and Peter and John that I won't lose my salvation. I have liberty to do what I want to do. And so they did. And they began to compromise in their beliefs. May I say this to you? Those that compromise will never, ever win. I'm not talking about compromising in business and friendships. Those things are needed. I'm talking about compromise in the spiritual realm. Those that compromise the beliefs and the doctrines of the Word of God, the fundamentals of the faith, as these people were doing, they will not win and they will never please God. It will never make God happy when you compromise. These Christians knew... I, I, listen to me. These Christians knew... This is a wonderful statement. The ones that were faithful like Antipas, these Christians knew that even dying for not compromising would give more joy and more peace in their life more than if they compromised and still lived. They knew in their heart compromising does not work. It does not please the Lord. It will not make me a winner, but it will make me a loser. They believe that even dying, because they would not compromise the truth of the Bible, would still bring more peace and more joy than if they lied and compromised and still lived. They were willing to die for their faith. If the sword came to cut their head off or to fed them the lions or whatever it was, they had been convicted by the great sword, the Word of God, and they had seen a, a sword that was far greater, far more perfect than any other sword that the Roman Empire had, far greater than the Roman Catholic Church had. They had got a relationship, 
and they had saturated their life with the sword, the Word of God. And because they had saturated their life, and this sword had cut, divided asunder sin, and the more that they allowed the sword, the Word of God, to cut their life, they didn't get mad and stomp out of church. They didn't get mad and say, I ain't coming back. That preacher don't love me. But they allowed the Holy Ghost of God. They said, Lord, what do you need to do in my life? I want you to do it because you're worthy of my all. And I know I'm not where I should be. And I'm not what I want to be and should be. But Lord, work in my heart. I give you my all. Cut me up if you have to, God. These were they. Thank God I want to be part of that crowd. That crowd. I say, Lord, I don't like the surgery, but Lord, you need to divide asunder the soul from the spirit of, of bitterness, spirit of jealousy, the spirit of covetousness, the spirit of unfaithfulness, the spirit of malice and strife, and the spirit of getting on the telephone and running somebody down. Running somebody down, whether it be Facebook or Twitter, and all that garbage from hell, if you don't use it right. Lord, I need my heart cut up real good. But then there were others that said, not me. I'll go my own way. I'm right, and I'm going to do what I think is right. It don't matter what that book says. And God says, I'm going to cut them up. Look at verse 16 in closing. With that being said, he says, repent. Very, very simple, Brother Bobby. He just said, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. There's that sword again. Can I say this to you, and I'll say it to you, and I know I preach with passion today, but I also preach with compassion. You don't care how much I know until you know that I care for you, and you know that. But if you're here today away from God and you've got a spirit that you shouldn't have, Jesus Christ said that if you don't get it right, you don't repent, he will come quickly and he will take the sword and he'll do some surgical, a surgical procedure. He may take a child. He may take a wife, a husband. He may cause you to be in a car wreck that you'll lose your use of your legs. It's a preacher, that ain't our kind of God. You don't know your Bible. You better get right with God. You better get right with God. And you better quit letting Satan ruin your life, ruin your worship, ruin your giving, ruining your loving and being an example. You better be careful. And if you decide that you're not going to get right, whoever it may be, we don't hide. As far as I know, we ain't having a problem right now. But I'm going to say this. If you decide not to get right and you decide to leave or quit church, we're going to pray for you. We're going to beg God to touch you. But you better understand, while you're here, you're going to get the sword of the Word of God. You're going to get the truth because I'm accountable for it. My two children were on their way to hell. Now they're saved. Some of you got children, grandchildren. If a man of God don't got some boldness and do right and line up with the Bible, your kids are going to go to hell. God help us to get right. Compromise will never satisfy the Lord. I'll end with this old parable. It's a Russian parable for those that listen to us in Russia. It's a Russian parable. And listen to this, children. This would be good about compromise. Because we, we're in that, it's, got, it's all around us, isn't it, Brother Bob? It's all around us. Churches are compromised all the time. Why? Get more people in. You know what we need to do to get more people in or we need to pray about? Brother Tim Hard Holloway said it well. He said, Preacher, if more Christians was filled with the Holy Ghost, we'd have more people in this church. He said that they would miss less. They'd be here. That's right. We don't need to have all kind of hot dog suppers. Those things are fine in its way. We don't have singing groups in all the time. Those things are fine in its way. But if we preach the Word of God and if we pray and people allow the Holy Ghost to fill them, they'll come to church. A hunter saw a bear in a field. He saw this bear in the field and 
he lifted up his gun and the bear was over there with his head down eating. And he raised up his gun to shoot that bear. And by the time he pulled the trigger, the bear stood up and said, Wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Isn't it better to talk your problems out than to kill each other? Well, he thought, he should have thought, why is a bear talking to me? <laughs> but he thought and he said, I guess you're right. So he lowered the gun. And the bear said to the hunter, now what do you want? He said, I want a fur coat. And the bear said, I can understand that. I, I got a good fur coat and uh, I know how it feels in winter to have a good fur coat. He said, uh, you know what I want? He said, I want a full stomach. So he said, uh, and the guy said, well, I know how it is to be hungry. I've seen you out here eating this field, so I can understand that. The bear said, well, come on over here and sit beside me. We'll talk about this. Let's negotiate. Let's work out a compromise. Well, the hunter, he laid his gun down, and he sat down beside the big old bear. And the story goes that just a few moments later, that the only person was left on the scene was the bear. And the bear stopped and told another bear, I just had a compromising meeting. I got my stomach full, and he got his fur coat. You heard about the, the guy in the Civil War? that decided to straddle the fence. He didn't know if he wanted to be on the north side or south side. Some things about the north he understood and believed in. Some things about the south he understood and believed in. He understood about state rights and all those things. And so he didn't know what to do. It's time for the battle. Battle started. He put on a blue uniform for the Union Army, and he just felt bad about it. He went back and put on a gray uniform for the Confederate Army. And he didn't know what to do, so he decided that he would wear it from the waist up, blue uniform with a hat, and the waist down he would wear the Confederate breeches and the sword and all that. Well, guess what? He got shot from both sides. Compromise will never work. God help us that in this age of compromise, all these churches and people compromising the truths of the sword, the sword of God, the Word of God, they change the words now. They take their little daggers and they find something that they didn't like. And they said that right there. And they take it out, crumb it up, throw it in a trash can, and then they flip up and they said, Ooh, let's get that. Tell you what, the Word of God has prevailed, it will prevail. And even though others will cut it to pieces and burn it up and throw it away, the Word of God or the sword of our God will prevail. Amen. And the last time we see the sword in the Bible is, is on a beautiful sunny day. The S-O-N is shining brighter than we'd ever seen them. And he's on a white horse. And behind him comes a bunch of other white horses. And on them horses, there's, there's the preacher who's fell off several horses. There he is. There's Sarah over there riding a the horse. There's Steve. He ain't got his wheelchair anymore. I don't know where it's at. It's gone. He's riding a the horse. There's all God's people riding a horse. They're not leading the Lord. The Lord's leading them. And all Satan is down there and all that evilness is cessed cesspool of wickedness is flowing on this earth and there's Satan with all his antichrist and all the evil ones and they're there the nations to fight against the Lord what a silly idea and the Lord said that I don't know where exactly where he's going to stop at but he's going to stop and he's going to slay them or destroy them if some of you don't mind kill them slaughter them with the sword of his mouth. What is that referring to? This has always been the sword of the Lord. It will remain the sword of the Lord. And this is what we better get accustomed to obeying. We better love it. 
we better saturate ourselves with it because this is the one and only book that we're going to be judged by. Thank God for the Word. Now, do you understand why I tell you the Word will be the front and foremost of all our ministries? You understand it will not be singings. It will not be congregational hymns. Those are good in this place. It will not be anything else. It will be the Bible because it is the sword that is sharper than any two-edged sword. God help us that in this age of compromise, we stay strong in our faith. We may lose a friend or two, but were they really our friends? We even may lose some members, but would they would they hurt us if they stayed anyway? Let's just stay true blue. Let's stay faithful and say, by the help of God, we'll serve Jesus till he comes again. And it's all because of the sword, the Word of God. God help us. Does God need to take the Word and cut from your soul to your spirit today? Is there some spirit that shouldn't be there? The Word of God has been cutting, and He needs to cut it off of your soul because your soul is His. And you don't need to be infested with sin. Is He trying to cut? You better let Him cut. You better let Him do it. It will be worth it all if you just let him have his way. Have thine own way, Lord. Thank you so much for listening to the sermon today. We hope and pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in John chapter number 14 that Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our prayer here at Open Door Baptist Church is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you, and he's more than capable and more than willing to cleanse you from unrighteousness and from your sins and make you a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says if you repent, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ and by faith believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection for your salvation, you too can be saved. Our prayer is that you think upon this and that very soon you'll make an eternal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you so much.